After the smash hit success that was Batman Arkham Asylum, Rocksteady wasted no time and immediately began development on a sequel. One which would continue the story set up in Asylum and expand upon already established gameplay, while at the same time providing us with new mechanics to master and hazards to face. It was to be an ambitious game, one which would reportedly feature a world five times the size of its predecessor. So it would be an understatement to say that expectations were high for this game when it was released in October of 2011. But how exactly did Rocksteady improve upon an already solid foundation? Well, let's find out. This is Batman Arkham City. 18 months after the events of Batman Arkham Asylum, Quincy Sharp, the former director of the asylum and now mayor of Gotham, has cornered off a section of the city, transforming it into a massive prison for all of Gotham's criminals. This facility is subsequently placed under the watch of psychiatrist Hugo Strange, who maintains control through his own private army. Strange effectively gives the inmates the freedom to do as they please, so long as they don't attempt to escape Arkham City. Meanwhile, Batman is worried that it's only a matter of time before the inmates escape and cause untold chaos in Gotham, so he begins his own campaign to shut down the facility as Bruce Wayne. But things quickly go wrong as he's apprehended by Strange and dumped into Arkham City to fend for himself, during which Hugo Strange reveals that he knows he's Batman and that in a matter of hours, something called Protocol 10 will cement Strange as a hero to all of Gotham. With a mystery to solve and his own identity at risk, Bruce Wayne realizes he can't leave Arkham City until he's figured out what his enemies are planning and how to stop them. So he puts on his suit and takes to the streets as Batman, determined to save Gotham once more. However, within a dark corner of Arkham City, Batman's oldest nemesis the Joker is planning to create a new kind of hell reserved only for himself and the Batman. When comparing Arkham Asylum's story to City, it's pretty clear that there was a major tonal shift. Where Asylum was more atmospheric, often delving into the horror genre, City is far more grounded in the superhero genre. Its stakes are bigger, its roster of characters is far larger, and everything about it just screams Hollywood blockbuster. It's definitely a more personal personal and emotional narrative when compared to Asylum, where that game showcased a Batman in his prime who's rarely phased by the challenges that laid before him. Here he's forced into one precarious situation after another that gradually wears him down, leaving him to confront his own mortality, which in turn makes it easier for the audience to connect with the man behind the mask, especially whenever he's conversing with his allies, defending the helpless, or talking with those few he trusts within the confines of Arkham City. Yet despite how dire things might get, Batman continues to prove to both himself and and others that he's one of DC's most adaptable heroes, especially when he has to contend with such a diverse cast of villains. Thanks to the open world and city, Rocksteady is able to expand its cast of characters for the sequel, giving many of the antagonists who are basically a footnote in Asylum more time in the spotlight, while also introducing us to a number of new and interesting villains, from the sympathetic to the cold-blooded. There's plenty of foes to take on, and thanks to some stellar writing, each one feels like a genuine threat to Batman. This horrible bunch of psychopaths are all begging to join up with me. But unfortunately for them, I only take the best. And today, best means whoever can kill you. None of them feel too lackluster or out of place in Arkham City's narrative. However, it's made pretty clear early on that much like Asylum, City's story is about Batman's relationship with the Joker, with events in the story forcing him to question whether or not his war of ideals against the Clown Prince is worth all the people who die in the process, which leads to easily one of the most shocking yet poignant conclusions in a Batman story. Arkham City's narrative doesn't just give us a satisfying payoff to hours of gameplay, it gives us a deep look into the psyche of Batman and his influence on those around him, while also maintaining the oppressive of atmosphere present in Asylum without sacrificing any of the charm from its characters. This is mostly accomplished thanks to some well-executed gameplay. Arkham Asylum's free-flow combat is back and it's never been better. While in Batman's first outing, your options were limited by the game's simplicity, here with a larger setting to tackle, the developers were able to seriously ramp up Batman's brutality. They accomplished this by tweaking certain mechanics of the combat and giving the player easier access to all of Batman's gear, allowing you to effectively maintain the pace of combat without having to slow down. However, while Asylum rarely had you fighting against more than six foes at once, here you'll be dealing with dozens of enemies on a regular basis, each one as aggressive and 
unintelligent as the last. More often, you have to contend with multiple enemies attacking you at once while also having to deal with a myriad of different weapons that they can possess. To help balance this out, the developers have included a number of new moves, like being able to counter thrown objects or attack while jumping. However, what's perhaps the biggest addition to your basic skill set is the change Rocksteady has made to your stun attack. Now, whenever you stun someone, you can initiate a beatdown, which allows you to quickly build up your combo meter. If executed perfectly, it can instantly take down a foe. It's without a doubt one of the most satisfying additions to the combat and gives you the means to quickly damage your enemies, whether they're wearing armor or not. Furthermore, while in Asylum, you had to be careful not to break your combo meter due to how difficult it was to build up. Thanks to the beatdown mechanic, you now have a viable method of building up your combo at any given time, giving the player access to Batman's special moves at a much faster pace than in Asylum. Speaking of which, there's been a noticeable improvement in how the special moves are designed. Where in Asylum you could only instantly take down an opponent or throw someone, in City there's a much larger variety of special moves for Batman to employ, which range from stunning enemies to instantly taking down multiple downed opponents or even destroying enemy weapons, which is a much needed addition considering all the new toys Batman's foes have access to in City. Furthermore, once you unlock Free Flow Focus, Batman can experience his surroundings in slow motion after building a large enough combo. However, should you use a special move or any of his gadgets during this, then his perception will return to normal. It's a solid addition that works well in portraying the seemingly superhuman aspects of Batman's character, while also giving the player more options to use in combat. The same could be said for the gadgets, which have received quite a noticeable improvement from the last game. For starters, all but two of the gadgets from Asylum are available right from the start of Arkham City, which saves you time and allows you to get reacquainted with your gadgets a lot more quickly than if you had to retrieve them again. Furthermore, while the gadgets in Asylum were extremely difficult to use in combat due to the button inputs, here they've been simplified so you can use them more quickly, which once again serves to help you control the pace of combat. But more importantly, while the gadgets in Asylum are more tailored towards traversing the environment than combat, here they've been reworked so that they can be used in every aspect of gameplay, not just one. One of the best examples of this newfound diversity is found in one of the newer gadgets, the remote electrical charge. In combat, it's capable of stunning your foes and sending armored enemies flying. In stealth, it can be used to create distractions or activate generators to disarm armed guards. Out in the game world, it can open doors, destroy machines, or activate generators to push and pull objects around within its general vicinity. Compare this to Arkham Asylum, where the most complexity a gadget showed was from the upgraded backclaw, and it becomes pretty clear how much work Rocksteady has put into refining the gadgets for the sequel. The fact is, the remote electrical charge is simply one of many multi-layered tools that can be used in a number of different situations. But by providing the player with both opportunities and reasons to use this gadget, it makes it a more viable tool in the long run. This is a sentiment which has clearly been shared with pretty much all the gadgets in Arkham City, both the old and the new. Rocksteady has effectively improved upon one of the most basic aspects of Arkham Asylum. Of course, while the combat and gadgets have undergone some substantial changes, the stealth mechanics have remained mostly unchanged from Asylum. Whether out in the open world or in one of City's many enclosed areas, you'll often be forced to contend with groups of armed men as quietly as you can. If you're spotted, it's almost certain death unless you can lose sight of your pursuers. However, if you remain unseen, then you can watch the terror slowly envelop your enemies as they begin to realize how outmatched they truly are. From a gameplay standpoint, the developers didn't need to do any major overhauls for the sequel. Instead, what Rocksteady did was provide the players with more options on how to tackle the stealth segments. This stops the stealth from becoming too monotonous, a common issue I found on repeat playthroughs of Asylum. For instance, the player now has access to smoke bombs, which allow Batman to disappear from sight in an instant. Furthermore, with the return of detective mode, Batman has the means to easily and safely observe his enemies from a distance. This secondary vision mode allows you to see enemies through walls, highlight notable hazards in your environment, and see special equipment that your enemies might be carrying. It is one of the best tools in your arsenal, especially whenever you're trying to be stealthy, which is why guards will now be carrying jammers on their backs that will block access to detective mode, effectively making the stealth much more complicated than it already was, which frankly is the best way to describe the stealth in Arkham City. For every advantage the game gives you, it also supplies your enemies with a way to counter it. You have various gadgets which can disable enemy weapons, so now there are weapon crates scattered throughout each area to resupply enemies. There are vantage points which you can use to survey enemy patrols, 
rules, so guards will destroy those upon detection or have them rigged with explosives beforehand. You have a myriad of new types of takedowns to employ against guards, but now enemies can lay out mines that will detonate when you're within close proximity. Furthermore, if there are civilians in the area, then you'll have to tread extra carefully, otherwise an innocent person will be killed. In short, you're gonna have to contend with a lot of different factors in order to be good at stealth in Arkham City. It's the kind of gameplay that rewards your patience and encourages you to be creative, which is the best way stealth should be handled in a game like this. Man, you must have really hated your mother. Like you wouldn't believe. From a gameplay perspective, Arkham Asylum had already laid out a solid foundation for Rocksteady to work with, so for the sequel, all they really needed to do was expand upon it, maintaining the basics while at the same time bombarding the player with new gameplay mechanics and hazards to contend with, which in turn keeps the player on edge throughout the entire campaign. With every victory, the player improves and so does the enemy. This naturally escalating difficulty makes the combat and the stealth more challenging without sacrificing any of the fun. Although it's pretty clear that there's more of a focus on the combat in this game than the stealth, which is hardly surprising. Clearly Rocksteady learned that beating people up as Batman is a lot of fun, so when they started work on the open world itself they needed to make sure it had enough content for players to enjoy, while also ensuring that it wasn't a hassle to traverse. They accomplished this by taking one of the least thought of aspects of Asylum and dialing it up to 11. The gliding has received quite the overhaul since the first game. Working in conjunction with Batman's grapple hook, now you're able to launch yourself from any point in the game world and begin gliding around the city with ease, which when coupled with the new dive bomb mechanic, a feature which allows you to ramp up up your speed and gain height in the process, you can effectively travel from one side of the map to the other without ever having to touch the ground. It's quite a big change when compared to Asylum, and honestly it only makes me wish that Rocksteady had implemented this mechanic sooner. Flying around Gotham is without a doubt one of the most visceral feelings in a video game. Going from casually weaving between buildings to barreling into an unsuspecting criminal is so bloody satisfying. The only time you'll ever really struggle with the flying is when you're attempting to complete one of the AR challenges scattered throughout the city, but even then these serve as a good test of your flying skills. Of course, if you're not in the mood for a flying challenge, then you're bound to find something else that appeals to you in Arkham City. Throughout the open world, you'll find a variety of different side stories to tackle, many of which involving other notable characters from DC Comics. These do a good job of expanding Rocksteady's vision of the Arkhamverse, with several side missions effectively laying the groundwork for events to come, while also providing you with an additional challenge which isn't solely based around combat. More often, you have to slip into the role of a detective, piecing together clues in your environment in order to track down the culprit to an insidious crime. Furthermore, since many of these side missions can't be fully completed until the end game, they possess a longevity that is lacking in many other open world games. Needless to say, there are quite a few surprises to be found throughout Arkham City, and you'd be amazed who might show up in the game. So, it's the world's greatest detective versus the world's deadliest assassin. Who's going to win? Of all the side stories in Arkham City though, it's the Riddler who will have your attention for most of this game. That's right, Mr. Insecure is back and with a vengeance. Once again he's littered the world with collectible trophies and riddles for you to solve. But this time around he's not just some disembodied voice who's looking to prove he's smarter than you. Now he's an actual physical being who's trying to prove he's smarter than you. Which means you actually get to punch him this time around. Oh and also he has hostages. So there's real stakes involved aside from wanting to 100% the game. Every time you complete a set number of riddles you'll be rewarded with a low location to one of these hostages, which results in you having to complete a puzzle in order to free them. These puzzles start out pretty simple, but as time goes on and you acquire more gadgets, they'll naturally become more complicated. They're an effective way to test your understanding of the game's mechanics, and the Riddler's constant goading does a good job of motivating you to track this little shit down. However, while the challenges the Riddler creates for you can be fun, actually earning the right to save these hostages isn't. Don't get me wrong, I love seeking out collectibles as much as the next player. However, I'd much rather tackle one of the Riddler's mini puzzles than a trophy, rather than just stumble onto a trophy that's out in the open with no protection at all. It just seems to me that a small percent of these Riddler challenges were given careful thought, while the rest were just dumped in random spots without a care in the world. Also it doesn't help that there's so many of them to find. While Arkham Asylum had 240 Riddler challenges, City has 440, which when you factor into the size of the open world and how many indoor locations there are, and you can start to see why I'm a little frustrated. There are just so many riddles to complete that it can appear to be quite overwhelming at times. Still, the developers did attempt to make it a little easier for you to find and complete these riddles. They did this by introducing Riddler informants into the game. These are criminals who work for the Riddler and have been hiding his trophies around the city. Knock them out and you'll get nothing. But should you finish an encounter with them as the last man standing, then you'll be able to interrogate them, allowing you to acquire the locations of riddles throughout parts of the open world. It's the fastest way to discover the locations of any secrets hidden in Arkham City. Plus it's just fun to watch hardened criminals beg for their lives. 
This can be as easy or as painful as you like. Don't, don't, don't hurt me. I'll tell you everything. I knew you would. Of course, if you happen to discover a Riddler trophy out in the world, you can always mark it with Batman's detective mode. That way you won't lose track of where you last saw it. It's a simple addition, but it really helps you manage your priorities out in the game world. Arkham City boasts a large world for the player to explore, when in reality what it gives you is a constantly changing environment full of secrets to find and characters to meet. Even if by some miracle you think the main story isn't good, there's more than enough content here throughout this super prison for you to enjoy. Still, if you reckon the main game isn't hard enough and you're looking for more of a challenge, then the challenge maps will be waiting for you to take them on. Returning from Asylum, the challenge maps have remained mostly unchanged from the first game. It's the simple idea of taking on a difficult challenge in order to earn a perfect score and prove that you are Batman. However, in order to achieve this, you need to meet certain conditions. For combat, it basically comes down to beating all your foes in one perfect combo, while with stealth, it's all about taking down your opponents in specific ways. But this time around, you also have a secondary mode referred to as the campaign. Basically, you'll be tasked to beat a series of challenge maps, but you have a limited number of tries to do so. Furthermore, there are also gameplay modifiers, which can be used to make the challenge maps more difficult or easier for you. It's an extra layer of complexity that'll force you to plan out each of your fights beforehand, especially since any modifiers left over will be automatically chosen for the final map in the campaign. So choosing the wrong modifiers at the wrong time can often lead you into an unwinnable situation. As a whole, the challenge maps are still a fun way to test yourself, but thanks to the game's widely expanded arsenal, it's now much easier for the player to earn that perfect score when compared to Asylum. More often, the real test with these challenge maps isn't found in Batman's gameplay, but whenever you're tackling them as one of the DLC characters. So what next? Help tall, brooding, and handsome? Or help myself to all the loot Professor Strange has locked up in that vault of his? I know. Difficult choice, right? There are noticeable improvements to how Rocksteady has approached the DLC in Arkham City. For starters, they're not just providing the player with new challenge maps to tackle, they're also giving you new skins for each of your playable heroes, allowing you to effectively customize the look of your characters, which is neat for the challenge maps, but I won't lie that it can be quite startling when using a different skin for Batman in the story mode. Often it makes him look out of place, especially if you pick one of the animated skins. But that's not all, you've also been given access to new stories in the Arkhamverse, one set during the main campaign and one after. In Arkham Asylum, we were given given the chance to play as the Joker, but in City we got not one, but three additional characters to play as aside from Batman. The most noteworthy one being longtime ally and love interest of Batman, Catwoman, who has her own story campaign that runs parallel to the main game's plot. Although it is pretty short and narratively speaking it isn't exactly the most complex story, but it does have its highlights. Gameplay wise, Catwoman isn't as durable as Batman, nor does she have as many gadgets as him, but she has more than enough skills at her disposal to make her a viable asset both in and out of combat. Her playstyle is more about avoiding damage than actually tanking hits from enemies. This is best demonstrated by her being able to latch onto ceiling grates during the stealth segments. Since she lacks armor and the means to quickly disappear if she's spotted, which basically means that getting discovered by armed thugs is pretty much a death sentence. So more so than Batman, Catwoman relies on her environment to stay out of harm's way. Honestly, I found playing as Catwoman to be a lot more tense than when I was Batman. This stripped down form of gameplay really puts you on edge, forcing you to carefully consider every action you take. It's the same design that was present with the Joker and Arkham Asylum and it seems to have been carried over to the sequel's DLC characters. Aside from Catwoman, Rocksteady also gives you the chance to play as Robin and Nightwing, who from a gameplay standpoint are basically slimmed down versions of Batman. They each have their own special moves, counters, and projectile based weapons, giving them some options in combat, but much like Selina, they lack the variety present in Batman's gameplay. As such, combat and stealth encounters can be pretty one-sided until you familiarize yourself with their individual skill sets, especially since you're incapable of permanently disarming enemies or effectively taking down large hordes. So while they're an interesting inclusion, I can't really find any reason to justify their part in the game, aside from providing an optional challenge for the player. Aside from these additional characters, the only other piece of noteworthy DLC would have to be Harley Quinn's Revenge, a short epilogue to the main campaign that honestly doesn't add a whole lot to the story of City. Sure, it gives you the chance to be Robin in an actual canon story, which was sadly missing in the base game, but aside from that, there isn't anything else really noteworthy about this DLC, aside of course from some new indoor locations to explore. As a whole, it's just more of City, only now you're restricted to a small part of the map with very little in terms of replay value. It's a piece of story DLC that doesn't overstay its welcome, while also not doing enough to justify its existence. Still, as a whole, there are clear improvements to how the DLC has been handled in Arkham City. It's a major step up from Asylum, and demonstrates how much faith Rocksteady now has in this franchise.
Returning from Arkham Asylum, Ron Fish and Nick Arundel are able to give Arkham City's soundtrack a real sense of awe from the opening act to its conclusion. While Asylum's music was clearly fixated on creating a tense and haunting atmosphere, here the music is far more epic. It's more of a grandiose orchestra emulating the themes of classic superhero movies and shows, while also serving as a foreboding backdrop to a dark and provocative location. The themes present in the soundtrack perfectly encapsulate those present in the story and its characters, often serving as a means to ramp up the tension Attention, especially during the Predator encounters, which is fitting for a game deeply rooted in the world of DC Comics. Hell, the main theme alone is worth being commemorated as an epic piece of music. In contrast, the sound design has remained pretty simplistic, only now it features a lot more naturally created melodies. Where Asylum maintained an aura of mystique with its eerily silent overworld, contrasted with the more boisterous effects created through the gameplay, Arkham City is a lot more lively as a whole. With the prison situated by the ocean in the middle of winter, there's a nice blend of environment mental sounds present throughout the game world. Furthermore, with Batman constantly intercepting enemy transmissions as he flies about, you're always reminded that there's a larger world out there, with people going about their lives, unaware or uninterested in the war that's taking place throughout Arkham City. Visually speaking, Arkham City is a massive step up from Asylum. For their first attempt at an open world game, Rocksteady have not disappointed. They've made sure to supply their game with enough detail to make Arkham City feel alive, whether by altering parts of the map due to events in the story, or by showcasing the natural degradation of Batman's suit. All of this is done while also maintaining the dark and decrepit aesthetic of Gotham. Yet as a whole, it's a much more colourful game than its predecessor, which has the added benefit of making the character models appear more realistic. Much like its previous installment, Arkham City runs on Unreal Engine 3, with the return to Arkham Remaster being upgraded to Unreal Engine 4. This has had the noticeable effect of improving the lighting and textures for many of Arkham City's environments, allowing natural lighting to give the overworld a crystal-like shine, which contrasts nicely with with a dark colour palette. However, much like Asylum, many of the textures in the remaster, especially on the character models, seem to have been downgraded or simply appear as though they've been slapped onto them. This is most noticeable on characters with facial hair or parts of their body that glow, which often clashes with the rest of their appearance, making the characters look less refined when compared to the game's stellar environments. Still, it's not as bad as Arkham Asylum's remaster. It's pretty clear that a lot more work has gone into refining the textures of Arkham City. Also, make no mistake, despite these minor shortcomings, Arkham City is still a very very pretty game. Batman Arkham City has everything one could ask for in a sequel. It expands upon every aspect that made the first game so great while also adding in a number of new features to improve gameplay. The combat is faster with more options available for the player to employ. The open world is large, with every inch of it lavished in detail and collectibles to find, while also possessing a number of unique side stories to warrant further exploration of Arkham City, which when combined with a nice collection of challenge maps to test the player and some decent DLC to back it up, what we're left with is without a doubt one of the best superhero games ever made. It effectively sets the benchmark for what to expect in this genre of gaming, while also leaving us wondering where Rocksteady might take this series next. Anyway, that's all the time we have for today. I'm the Grave Tender, and thank you for joining me on the other side. Please consider subscribing, and I hope you all have a nice day.